I'm down to the last Bakelite block, rebuilding it now. It's one of the coupling caps, and on top of it, hooked up rather oddly, is number 19, the 250 picofarad cap. It's a mica cap, where uh, it's this big rectangle, and it's got lugs coming out of either end. One of them is all globbed up onto uh, this end of the Bakelite block, and the other is put through this mounting screw the chassis and I could not get a tool onto that to get it off. I had to use some needle nose pliers and eventually get lucky to just loosen it up a little bit and then I could slowly uh, rotate it around because it comes right up next to the body of the cap. Uh, I'm thinking I'll re possibly replace that just because it's so awkward to work around. <laughs> um, I certainly am going to have to remove it to uh, get out the, the cap that's underneath there. And then uh, this end goes right over to the volume control. And that's that's where they tacked on an extra uh, 0.01 microfarad cap. So that area is a little messy anyways. Uh, but we'll see. Um, see how it goes. I think I'll test that too while I've got it out. There's two other Mica caps up here. Uh, I'll tell you why, because I was playing this last night and it didn't sound as good. I was starting to hear some kind of crashing and the reception wasn't as good as it seems like it had been previously. Um, and that's what can happen when a Mica cap starts breaking down. Um, uh, after that, I'll restuff these two boxes and uh, the tone control. I was just reading some advice on how to do this. Um, rather than melt out this whole block, uh, they suggested if you pry open this box just a little bit, you can lose up the tension and just take this entire block out without any heat whatsoever. That's what I'm going to try doing. As I was struggling to get this mica cap off, it occurred to me, hey, maybe it's not original, so... I pulled out the parts placement diagram and you know what? It looks different. It's number 19 and they show it as not only a smaller square but they show the ground lug being the cap above it and then going over to this terminal. In other words they show the ground lug going to this cap. They also show this cap as being oriented Vertically, which as I rotate it around makes a lot more sense because it seems to put all these components back uh, They're all <laughs> that they, everything looks bright. It was sort of when it was like this everything was sort of smooshed over um, Weird um, So now I'm even more inclined to replace that cap if it's not even original and also maybe let's check the value because you know These changes that were down here seem to have all been done to affect the frequency response and that cap is going uh, across the volume control. I'm pretty sure, and it's a pretty small value cap, which should um, filter high frequencies. So maybe they tinkered with that um, to affect their frequency response. I don't know what value that is. I won't know until I get it out and flip it over. And even then, I may have to get it on my tester because the dot codes on these old ones are weird. Like that's 110, but it's got a yellow and a blue dot. You have no idea. That does not follow any, any color code that I'm aware of. It's just an um, internal um, color coding scheme. Oh, so it's, it's a weird case of do you follow the service info or do you follow what's in front of your eyes in terms of like the way I'm orienting things and the way components are hooked up. It's hard to say. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of going with my gut instinct that like, like rotating this kind of makes everything look right. Um, why do things get mushed over? Well, some of these parts that they that were added, it seems like they had to move things a little bit to get uh, the leads to hook up and whatnot. I'm also going to go ahead and replace some of these parts, even though they test okay, like this resistor, because it, there's a chunk of it broken off, which uh, you know, I'm not not too crazy about. Uh, the, these caps are just all temporary. These all these will all be going away and be going inside these boxes. Uh, the other reason I kind of yeah, I'm torn about replacing these resistors is the newer ones are smaller, like that size, and it'll make this all look a lot neater. Uh, these old leads are so darn thick. I mean, it's good in terms of that's why they can get away with putting three parts connected in spaces because these won't move because the leads are so thick. 
On the other hand, I've had a couple of them break because um, they're so inflexible and so thick that you get fatigue at the end of it, like the resistor down here, the end of it just broke off. So you got to be careful when you move these things around. They can't take a whole lot of uh, stress and strain. That's probably why that chunk broke off of this one. Here's the other side of that cap, and you can see how that wiring was done really crudely. So I, I'm, I'm convinced that this was unwrapped, reoriented, uh, reconnected, and just a blob of solder thrown on it. Uh, I still don't know whether this cap is original or not, though. On the other side, there's nothing. Which does follow Philco's, con Philco's convention of using parts that just have um, some sort of inter internal color code. Uh, it's a poly... Polymet branded cap. I can't see what brand the others are. So yeah, I started out this series talking about restoring with a minimal amount of uh, test equipment. Part substitution is a perfectly valid technique, just like swapping out tubes with known good tubes if you don't have a tube tester. Same deal with this. Uh, that's why it's a good idea to buy an assortment of capacitors, resistors when you're starting out. So if you're not sure, swap the part out. If nothing changes, you can put the old one back in. Uh, a good capacitor bridge leakage tester that rates, tests it under full rated voltage, like 500 or 600 volts, are a little hard to come by. Uh, one thing I do have also is this little cheesy tester I got for 20 bucks or something off of eBay. Uh, but this only puts a few volts across it while it's testing it. So, um, But hey... It does say it's 221 picofarad, it's supposed to be 250, we'll check with the bridge. Um, what this will not test us, tell us again, is it, um, if it's leaky, I don't know how much voltage would be across it in the circuit. Um, yeah, it's going to the grid, to ground, okay. It's probably not going to be more than a few volts across it uh, anyway, so it's probably. Alright, um, but, uh, you know, that, that's an option, too. Uh, these come in a variety of styles and packaging. I got this one because it had a, a built-in battery that you can recharge with a USB port and a nice colored display. Um, I don't trust it, really, but um, for a, a quick test, uh, sure, it's fine. Here's what a modern dipped silver mica capacitor looks like. 220 picofarad, 500 volts. Voltage rating isn't stated, but I, I can tell you that's way overkill for how this is used. Here is my vintage restored solar capacitor bridge. This is not a critical component at all. Uh, I'm mainly doing this for curiosity. You'd use a ceramic cap in there, it would work just fine, I'm sure. Uh, so checking for leakage and full voltage. There's no leakage, which is about 500 volts. Uh, let's check the capacitance. Huh. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's about 220. For some reason, my camera does a terrible job on this eye tube. Well, it looks maybe okay on the viewfinder there, so... Um, yeah, that's, that's around 220-ish. So, um... That's probably just fine. I took a photo, I'll post it on the Philco forum and say, yeah, that's what the original cap looked like. Um... <sighs> the only reason I hesitate to use it is I kind of want to install it the way they showed in the parts placement diagram and it's not going to fit. Uh, I don't think that orientation. Anyways, let's get this cap restuffed, and uh, I'll replace some of these resistors while I'm at it. So, I know, I know I'm talking a lot, but this is the thought process I go through constantly while I'm doing on stuff. I thought i convey it to you is, when do you stop? What's enough? When is a part bad? Like I chuck a resistor, maybe these are off by 20%. That's with intolerance. Uh, do I leave it? Do I replace it? I mean, there's plenty of people who just go through and replace all the resistors. There's nothing wrong with that. And the radio will work fine. Uh, maybe better. Be more reliable. <laughs> I don't have an easy answer for you. Um, 
Because the more I replace, the more I think about, well, why don't I just go ahead and replace all of them? Because the original look is gone anyways. I can save these parts, include them in a little baggie inside the, the cabinet if somebody wants to know what they look like, if they ever want to replace them. i got plenty of reference photos. I can just blow through, replace them all, and be done with it. And uh, I'd have to keep guessing about everything. Uh, and honestly, I'm still, as I think you can tell, <laughs> I'm torn about what to do. I plan on keeping this radio at least for a while. Um, and that's part of my decision making too. If it's something I'm going to sell, and especially if I'm going to ship it a long distance, I would tend to replace everything that I think might fail because I don't want to, I want the customer to be happy. I don't want them to be sending it back for repairs or anything like that. If I'm using it, I'm a lot looser with stuff because if something fails, I can fix it. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. In the end, I decided not to use that cap. It just didn't look right to me. So I got this oriented the way they show in the parts placement, and I hooked this up the way they show in the parts placement. So instead of having a big cap covering up all this stuff, uh, and I bent it kind of out of the way so it's not uh, too intrusive, and that's ground, and that's going to the volume control. So that's, that's that. Now I'm moving on to doing one of the boxes. Uh, so there are three caps in here. I'm going to use these three guys. A 1 microfarad, 0.1 microfarad, and originally a 0.25. I'll use a 0.22. Three, or one end of each of these three caps will get connected together, and then uh, get attached to the box where that solder blob is there. That is a common ground. And then the other three need to come out as wires like we see here. Now I do have some reproduction, what they call pushback wire which is nifty stuff, you don't need to strip it. It's cloth covered and beneath that it's like a plastic covering and instead of stripping it you can just uh, well you just push the insulation back and then uh, attach that to whatever. So I will run three, I think I got a spool of black, this is brown I'll look around for it. I'll attach uh, three wires to the three caps, run three leads out um, and then to secure it inside, because obviously these three caps are way smaller than the original ones, I'm not going to fill this up with hot glue or tar. That's, that's a bit of overkill, but I also don't want it to just be flopping around. Um, well, maybe what I can do is, these leads are pretty stiff, especially on this one microfarad. So if I run that out through this and tack solder it onto the top, that should work pretty well. And I think I'll stuff some, uh, um, bubble wrap or, uh, or styrofoam or something in there to kind of keep things from rattling around inside. It should hold up for a very long time, I imagine. Here we go, black. I knew I had more of this stuff around, and actually this is thicker than I needed. So this is brown, and then I have yellow, red, and black. I think I got this thicker stuff for filament wiring. Uh, boy, I'm glad that I got the stuff I did because wire, well, not only has gotten a lot more expensive, but it's harder to find. I do have a bunch of reproduction cloth stuff. Although, really, what this stuff is, it's, it's plastic insulated wire. And they put cloth over the outside. So, notice how thick this is. Underneath, it's basically this. And then they put cloth over it. It's also stranded, which makes it, or is it solid? I don't remember. Let's see. Uh, I can't tell from that. Uh, so, wire. Um, you can still find it out there from various suppliers, like Antique Electronics Supply or uh, Radio Days. Um, probably has some. The car folks, uh, they have reproduction ignition wire that's cloth covered, and um, vintage appliance repair people like Lamp Cord. You get cloth covered stuff if you want. Um, but notice the, all this wiring in here, it's, it's very, well, not very, but basically it is this stuff. Uh, really are no, not much in the way of color. Um, some, I mean, there are some colors. The filament is maybe greenish originally. Uh, anyways, um, solid versus stranded. Uh, solid is nice because you can bend it and it stays put. Downside is you can't flex it too much or it breaks. So you'll see variety throughout a radio too, like this stuff is solid. And you move it and it stays put. 
uh, this thicker stuff this is stranded and all this down here is stranded it's just gotten so stiff because the old uh, insul uh, insulating material inside the rubber is really hardened up and there is actually some rubber wiring in here too uh, this this tone control wire must have been like a separate sub-assembly maybe a different company made it I don't know but the rubber wire on it is really cracked badly uh, bare wire showing through in spots it's this guy so it's, that's got to get replaced when I take this out ideally obviously you can use all the wire that's there um, but sometimes well you just can't so yeah I, I suppose I could clip this off and reuse it um, but since I've got a spool of it I'll just use this new stuff Here are the three caps connected together at one end with extension wires added. Then I slid some 1 8 inch diameter heat shrink tubing and shrunk it down. And if it fits, I'm going to try taking this large heat shrink tubing and putting over all of them. Uh, of course you want to keep track of what wire goes to what because they are three different values. And I did kind of eyeball it as to how long the wires should be and added a few inches so I shouldn't have any issue with that yeah that worked out quite well that large size tubing did uh, fit over them quite nicely so now this needs to go into the box and hook up the ground like so slide the wires through the cardboard and put it down. I notice there's a little notch. That's where the uh, ground wire came out originally. Um, if I got enough lead length on that, I'll run it through that hole. Otherwise, I can attach some extension bus wire I've got around here. I notice how similar it is to my roll of solder. You don't ever want to accidentally grab the wrong stuff because if you're holding this and heat up the end, it's not going to melt, but it's going to transfer the heat to the roll, in which case you can burn yourself <laughs> pretty good. Uh, anyways, I'll uh, add a little of this to that so I can run it through that slot. And I'll get some little labels to put them on the wires before I seal this up so I know what's what. I happen to have some small packing foam material lying around, so that's what I used. And there it is, extension wire soldered to the box, and it's sealed back up, and I labeled the wires, so ready to reinstall right about there. The second rebuilt box capacitor has been installed. And I couldn't resist cleaning this up. I figure if I'm going to be replacing a couple of the resistors anyways, I might as well just go ahead and replace all of them. Uh, one advantage of the smaller size is you can see all that's going on. You can see the wiring underneath and, and whatnot. And I just got a comment about the sizes of resistors. Yeah, it's going to be confusing to somebody down the road. And to be honest, it's kind of confusing now. Um, for example, is that resistor the same wattage as that? I think they're both half watt based on what I've read. Likewise, I think that's one watt. Um, you go by the size. And yeah, depending on the era it was made and the material it was made out of, the size varies. So with these modern ones, um, that, that applies as well. I'll get the, the three sizes out and show you what I mean. I pulled out some examples of the type of resistor I've been using, which is made by Vichy. That's 1 watt, 2 watt, 3 watt. That is the PR series of metal film resistors. So the size definitely increases with wattage. However, that's within this family. Here's one made by a different manufacturer, Zycon, I think. It's metal oxide to the best of my memory. What wattage is that? Is it a 2 watt? Is it a 3 watt? I'm not sure, honestly. I don't have the original packaging anymore. I threw it in the bin with these other 220Ks. I'm not sure anymore. I think it's a 2 watt. 
if I had to guess. So there's one reason when you sort your resistors, don't just do it by value, but do it by wattage or keep them with the original packaging. Or as I've been doing lately, only stick with one brand so there's no confusion. However, for a future repair person 50 years from now, yeah, they will have a bit of a challenge to know, um, even if they knew these were all 2 watt, they won't know what was in here originally. Uh, these certainly don't all need to be 2 watt, these were all half watt um, originally. But I, I don't I don't have an answer for you guys about <laughs> what to do. You can put notes, restoration notes, in with your, your radio, I suppose. Otherwise, well, you'll just leave it up to the person down the road in the future, if it ever gets repaired again, that they will have a fun little challenge to figure out. Next up, tone control. I just pulled off the knob and remove the nut that was holding it on. I should be able to push it through to the back. The wires and the power switch are kind of in the way and they're really crunchy and crusty. Now, now those red one's already cracked. Uh, insulation's already cracked from me moving it earlier. So maybe that wire should just get replaced anyways. Uh, that is a tight squeeze. I suppose you could take the filter choke out and free up a little more room. Wouldn't be so bad if these wires weren't so immobile and dry and crusty. Uh, there we go. Alright. I'm just going to cut. There's only one wire going to it. And that wire definitely has to get replaced because it's old rubber coated wire that's really rotted. And that's all there is to it. Silver plated switch contact, that's why it looks kind of blackish like that. Looks like there's some grease, a residue of grease on there. So inside this there are three capacitors. One is a .015, that goes in the first position. The rest are .01s, and it just uh, shorts them out to ground. And notice the contacts, there's three that are all together, so as you go through this, it puts the capacitors in parallel one by one. And then that uh, goes to your uh, signal, which is actually just the plate of the output tube, so it's pretty, pretty crude arrangement there for a tone control. So what do we need to do? We need to get that tar block out, snip all those leads, mount some new caps in and reinstall it. This is a little odd. I'm not sure why there's this big extended uh, thing sticking out like a screw terminal. Um, and all I gotta do is put the wire on that. It doesn't look original to me. I wonder if that was a Maybe an experimental modification along with adding other caps. This way, trying to tinker with the frequency response of this. <laughs> I'm not sure. I think I will take that off and just run up three wires to uh, each of these three. And then somewhere on this block, there, the other side of this cap is going to be. Uh, or no, no, no. So, 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 uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was going to say it needs to be grounded, but no. It's grounded through uh, the, the body itself being mounted to the chassis provides the ground contact. I reinstalled the rebuilt tone control. Didn't bother to pot it up with anything. I think it's fine the way it is. There's three caps down in there. One common end is this new red wire I used to replace this crunchy old rubber wire and yeah it's red and not black I thought I'd mix it up a little bit so let's see how it works let's see if we can find any music
So this with no capacitance this position. Second. No tone control, no cap in the circuit. First cap, second cap, third cap. Get to a station that's a little bit clearer. Defense no really cap. Well after the you know the one explosive early on, you know, we knew it was going to be one of those games that field position was going to be important, ball security was going to be important, and uh... so yeah, cool. Before you could tell when it was engaged, but there wasn't that much difference between the various positions. Now it's definitely noticeable, as is all the hum and crackling on the radio, which I'm not too crazy about. I have the radio plugged directly into the wall now so we don't have to hear the background hum of the Suncor Variac. And I've been noticing something. I've power cycled this a few times. When it first comes on, it can be kind of crackly and poppy for a while. And later on, occasionally, things kind of drop off. Let's point out exactly how it was when I last turned it off. Now, oh, see, while I'm recording, of course, it's not going to happen, but we'll see. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. What just happened? We just lost everything. And then there's a pop. And if you recall early on, I mentioned that, um,. When I first turned it on, it would be kind of silent for a while, then it would be kind of a louder pop, and then and sound would come through. It seems to be a somewhat similar issue. And that's working, but with reduced gain, and usually, there we go, it pops and it comes back. So what's going on? I'm hoping it's a problem with the tube. It just seems to be a heat related thing. So if one of these tubes is flaky, like it's got some shorts in it, it could definitely do that. So the very next thing we're going to do is test these tubes. All the tubes tested fine. I cleaned the tube sockets, I cleaned the contact points on the tuner cap. The problem remains and actually may have gotten a little worse. Also curious that without the tube shield on, uh, we're still getting sound with the volume all the way down. Now I had speculated earlier that it was from leakage between caps and those blocks, but there's another possibility a viewer mentioned that uh, I think is worth noting, that maybe the IF is leaking through and it's being detected and amplified by one of the AF stages and getting through that way. Uh, sure, that seems like a definite possibility. Charmed by him, uh, to go to it's working all right now, except for the crackle. Uh, I expect at some point it's going to cut out. And when it uh, cuts yeah, out, no tapping or wiggling I've tried anywhere does anything. It just will randomly pop back on. Which again makes me think uh, Micah Cap seems like a possibility. The side of the first tone position sounds the best. Without anything in there, 
You definitely get more hiss and crackling. I think that sounds pretty good. So what is causing that? Now, since it's happening while I'm turning this, you would think, well, it's got to be an issue with the tuner. Although, I don't know, right now, I'm not touching it and it's doing it. I've cleaned those contacts. Ah, and they're now cut out. By cutting out, I mean the gain is greatly reduced. I did some more... I did some more system mat. I checked some voltages, specifically the AVC voltages and B+, both when the set is playing well and then when the volume drops by 70% or so. B+, did exactly the same. Both AVC voltages went less negative, which should have boosted the gain, but um, apparently it's not. So... There's not a whole lot left on the front end to change. If there's two original resistors left, I think that's, that's it. Um, on one on the uh, antenna coil. Um, so what I'm going to try doing is, well, let's swap out the tubes that are in the IF. I've been playing musical chairs with them and tested them, and they test fine, but something's going on. Um, so let's swap out all the tubes again. I have gone through a pile of 24 tubes, 24 and 24A, even some Philco branded globes, even pulled out a Blue Arcturus 27 because why not? With these tubes, uh, it seems stable. I did not get the volume cutting out problem, but it has a lot less gain. Um, so I suspect some of these tubes are a little weak, so instead of testing all these tubes and sorting through them, this thing seems to be really picky about what 24s go into it. I'm going for broke, and I cracked open my box of real new old stock tubes. Uh, as it turns out, that I thought I had new old stock tubes in those boxes, but no, they were used tubes that I stuck into boxes. And I'm pretty sure in here is the real deal. These are a uh, set of tubes I assembled for my Westinghouse WR8, which has been languishing for a very long time. But in here, I believe, are at least one, two, three, four uh, 24s and several 27s, and I'm pretty sure these are new old stock. Uh, I just want to see if these work and it works well and reliably, and if it does, I'll take them out and prepackage them back up and um, keep sorting through the 24s. Maybe I'll buy some off of uh, one of the online vendors. Um, so here we go. Oh, isn't that a beautiful sight? A set of new old stock tubes. Uh, these are 24s, these are not 24As. Uh, so we'll see how they work. Tube chart on this radio says 24. I'm pretty sure that's what it originally came with. I know they've got a design flaw, but that's what it says, so that's what I'm putting in there. All right, radio's been cold for a while. Let's power it up with all those new old stock tubes in there. So I've mentioned 24s and 24As before. It's my understanding that the problem with the 24s was twofold. One, because of the internal element structure, they had a tendency to break into oscillation. And uh, two, the warm-up time was kind of inconsistent. And uh, playing around with these tubes, I've noticed that. That with the 24As in there, uh, the tuner radio on, it, the volume would gradually come on with these 24s. It's weird. And it takes a lot longer. By weird, I mean... Uh, 
it can take a while to kind of stabilize and sound good and have good volume. Something else I uh, hadn't realized while taking voltage measurements, uh, and I was measuring like minus one volt, say, for the AVC control grid, you know, as it's like gradually getting louder, <laughs> uh, is that the cathodes on these 24As are not grounded. They are tied together on these 324s, and they go down and around and around and around and over to 0.3 which is a resistor, 60 ohm resistor going to ground. What does that do? Well, this resistor is going to be plus, it's a voltage dropper. So it turns out 0.3 should be about 20 volts, meaning these cathodes are 20 volts. So when me I'm measuring with respect to ground, there may be minus one volt on the grid. But with respect to the cathode, it's minus 21 volts. Because minus one volt is not much of a negative bias on a tube. The tube would be really turned on hard, like and distorted and weighed, um, pushed too hard if it was really only minus one volt. So what's one thing I, I want to verify? I've been checking grid voltages and plate voltages. I have not paid attention to the cathode voltage because I thought they were grounded. Now that fade does happen with these tubes as well, unfortunately. But also it's not as loud with these tubes as it was with the 24As. I put the volume up all the way. So it's curious um, that with the 24As that I had in there, it turns out those are the best performing after going through all these tubes, putting in new old stock tubes. Nothing works as good or as well as the 24As I had in there initially. <laughs> Um, I should say initially after the after the testing and 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 so on. So I'm going to pack back up all these globe tubes, <laughs> and uh, I did remember which uh, 24As I had in there, and put those back in there and focus on other issues. So I got some suggestions online. Number one, just replace all the resistors so we can eliminate that. Two is well to check for anything else, which could be yeah, bad connection. By that I mean solder joint, but it could also be a bad mechanical joint. So I'd gone around and I retightened up these quarter inch nuts, but there are other things. There are these uh, trimmer caps, um, which also get their ground going to the chassis. So one problem with that is in certain areas there are different metals. It might be aluminum and steel, or brass and steel. And uh, if there's some corrosion, like, notice there's corrosion here. That's an aluminum can and a steel chassis, and there's corrosion between the two. If you get that, it can um, break the, the connection between the two. And maybe if something warms up, a, a joint opens up a little bit, and it loses a ground connection. So uh, I want to go over everything that I, that I can, that I can think of, including this uh, tuner assembly. I've also been ignoring this wire wound resistor. I just assume since it measured good initially that it would stay good. Uh, so let's check those cathode voltages now and then when the volume fades, make sure that the cathode voltages are still the same. Maybe they're not. Maybe the grid maybe the grid hasn't been the issue all along, it's been the cathode. Well, I think things just got interesting. I've been poking and prodding and check, trying to check tube voltages as best I can. Uh, one problem though is I can't trust this one voltage chart I do have because it doesn't make any sense. I'll tell you a few reasons why. 24 RF tube cathode is connected directly to the 24 IF tube cathode. On the voltage chart they show one being 20 volts, one being 18. They can't be different. They're connected together. Worse, first I uh, first AF tube, 27. Cathode, grounded. First AF tube, cathode, 20 volts. That's impossible. It has to be zero volts. And the fact that there's a handwritten arrow pointing up to that makes me <laughs> question whether this is valid. 
So, I'm just going to go back to what makes sense, which is that uh, the grid should be negative with respect to the cathode, and the plate should be positive, and it should be a few hundred volts and all that. One thing to help us out is a nifty thing with these new old stock radiotrons is there's a data sheet right inside. It shows the pinout and the uh, maximum voltages, most maximum recommended. So we should have a screen voltage of 75 max, plate of 180 max, and grid minus 1.5 max. Uh, I do think their little tube thing is flipped around. It doesn't say whether it's the top side or the bottom side. But, well, anyways, let me, let me go through and, and show you what I've been finding. So, let's start with the 24 on the right, which is the first detector. So, it's, it's uh, this guy on the schematic. Uh, so, I know that the two on the top of the heaters, and then there's the other three, and the grid is on top. Well, this guy... Uh, the meter so you can see it. This pin has about 239 volts. I figure that's got to be the plate. And the one in the middle is 51 volts. That's got to be the screen. And that only leaves the cathode, which is 5 volts. Which is what I measured at the voltage divider resistor down below. So that charger that should be 20 volts, I'm getting 5. So that's one potential problem. The bigger problem, though, is the 24 tube on the left, which is the RF amp. If we go to that, this which we believe is the cathode is 2 volts, okay? And then the middle, which we believe is the screen, which connected to all the other screens for the 24s, is 51 volts. That's fine. Uh, and then we get to what should be the plate, as near as I can make out, and it's one and a half volts. Uh, <laughs> that's a problem. It should be a couple hundred volts. So perhaps there is a problem with that connection. Uh, what does that go to? Unfortunately, it goes directly to a coil. So do we have an open coil? Potentially. Uh, so, time to start measuring things uh, resistance-wise. So here I go thinking, well, I'll just pull out my parts chassis and I'll take the coil out of that one. It appears to be open on this coil as well. <laughs> uh, it's this guy right here. We're going to clip off these wires and remove that quarter inch nut and pull it out. I've been careful to uh, deal with this grid cap uh, as a hole in the top of that shield, I think. The only way to do it, well, two ways. One, disconnect the wire coming down below, which I believe is going to this lug, or unsolder the grid cap up top. Uh, since I gotta clean out the lugs anyways, I'm thinking it's actually easier to just unsolder it down below. Um, so it's a drag that they both appear to be open. I'm hoping. Uh, that it's like Philco 60s, which I've had to repair the oscillator coil on uh, on several of those, in which the primary winding is over the secondary winding, because that's what's open, the primary. If the secondary winding is over the primary, uh, that's going to be a real pain, because I'm going to have to unwind the secondary to rewind the primary, and then put the secondary back on top of it. I do not look forward to having to do any such thing, so... Let's hope uh, that these are good. And I'm really curious to see, well, I'll just get it out then, then we'll carry on. Well, here it is, and it's as I feared. It does have the same problem that a bunch of other Filcos have. Namely, they put a, an insulating celluloid plastic layer between the primary and the secondary, and over time, that plastic swells and cracks, which tends to pop open 
the winding, which I'm pretty sure is the primary, so that part's not too bad. Uh, to fix it, assuming that um, we're going to have to rewind this, well, we need to count how many turns there are and in what direction they're going. Uh, take this off, put some kind of different insulator on there, and uh, rewind it. We are lucky. The brake was right up here where the top winding came around, did a little loop and came down to this lug. So I scraped off the insulation up here and we have continuity from this point all the way to this lug. So we just need to attach, uh, splice in a little uh, wire, loop around and run it down to here and clean off all these lugs and pop it into the other radio and we should be good to go. So here's my big old spool of magnetic wire, you know, I never thought much about this, I don't know where I got it years ago. Um, but now that I've seen how much enameled wire costs per pound, this is, I don't know, three pounds? That's like over a hundred dollars worth of wire just sitting here in my hand. Uh, unfortunately it's a little bit bigger diameter than they used on this, and it's definitely bigger than what's in the field coil, so I could not use this. To rewind that field coil, now it'll be fine for just doing this little pair, though. Made by General Electric in Schenectady, New York. Is there a gauge on this? Nope. I'm thinking maybe 30? Something like that? I don't know. Now let's get a little piece off and then carefully splice it on. Should really uh, get an assortment of magnetic wire, at least like 10 feet or so of uh, some different sizes. Just seem to be having to repair more and more coils. I seem to recall saying something about this being a simple relaxing project. Yeah, yeah that's exactly what it is. Okay, the radio is back playing stably. I put uh, some 24As back in the set, um, basically the ones I was using earlier. Uh, I hope we all learned something. Um, I knew better. I chose to ignore my past experiences and ended up wasting some time, although it was fun to pull out some old globe tubes. What do I mean by that? Methodical troubleshooting almost always wins in the end. I should have been checking voltages, double checking resistances, coil continuity and all, instead of just swapping tubes. And honestly, it's rarely the tube and a radio wouldn't be that sensitive to tubes where I was having trouble where every time I put in a new set of 24s it was behaving differently. It shouldn't be that picky about tubes. These designs generally work over a wide range of tolerances and manufacturing um, inconsistencies and so on. So, the radio's playing great now. I had it playing for a long time. No fade. All right. So it must have been just hanging on very tenuously. And as the radio would get hot, the connection would open up, cool down. It would make reestablish contact. Maybe it was even arcing. After all, it had the full plate voltage on it, so several hundred volts. Not enough to really arc over a large distance, but the wires' ends were really close together. Just maybe. Okay, now i got the chassis back up top side, and I'm doing a little bit of cleaning. Um, I'm going to try to get these numbers off. Uh, alcohol doesn't work. Um, lacquer thinner didn't work too well either. Honestly, what's working better than anything is some simple green and a little scrub brush. Uh, and generally speaking, this chassis is pretty filthy. I didn't realize it at first. I thought this gray was just kind of the patina. And, and it is to a large extent. But there's also kind of a baked on layer of dust. Uh, that I've been working on getting off. Word of warning though. Um, as someone who has worked on a number of grungy radio chassis. Pick your battles. 
either go <laughs> go full bore and if you really want the chassis to look good and take everything off and paint it, replate it, do whatever you want to, you know, bead blast it, whatever. Or do as little as possible because going in between, I think you will drive yourself nuts, which is what I do. Like, there are little splotches of light surface rust here and there. I could get out navel jelly and some Q-tips and start trying to get them all off. I will tell you what will happen. You will get the rust off, but the color of the metal is going to change to something like that. So is it better to have some barely visible light rust patches here and there, or to have splotches of light gray here and there? So then you're going to be tempted to, well, let's clean up the whole chassis, and then you're going to run into, well, all the stuff that's mounted all over the place. Jupiter, what are you doing? That is not for you. Sorry, I'll get you a toy. Um, so um, I'm trying to spare you some grief. <laughs> uh, you, you can completely disassemble this. You will have to pop out some rivets here and there. Um, it'll be kind of a pain to get it all back together. But short of doing that, I'd say just, just do a light cleaning. Just save yourself the headache. It took 90 years to get looking like this. This must have been in a damp environment at some point. It's got little spots of rust all over. Um, you see the tuning caps is big aluminum, but apparently this is some sort of mild steel because even the plates have a little bit of corrosion on it. I am not going to go through and get all that off. Likewise, I am not going to polish up all these aluminum cans. Yes, it would look beautiful if this was like recadmium plated and the aluminum was all polished up and the transformer was repainted and all that. And I've seen people do it and it looks fantastic. I don't have the time, patience, or money to do that right now. So I am just going to lightly brush and scrub and clean it up and clean off all the glass tubes and leave it at that.